So, uh, to be honest, I really don't remember people's confession. I, I really don't. But occasionally I'll remember not who the person is, but I'll remember what somebody confessed. And when I was a newly ordained priest, this guy uh, wanted to go to confession because he was having a very serious uh, surgery and he thought he would, might die, so he wanted to go to confession, which I'm like, oh, of course. So he goes to confession, and the confession was where he said, well, I, I really haven't broken any of the Ten Commandments lately, so I guess I'm doing good, but I want to receive absolution. And, like, I was just kind of surprised, so, you know, I'm newly ordained, and like, yeah, sure. But, you know, I started to think about it afterwards, like, the following week, I was like, that was really bizarre. Like, if you had to go to confession and all you can say is, well, I haven't broken any of the Ten Commandments, um, I mean, that's great. There's too much coveting thy neighbor's ox going on. But, um, <laughs> you know, but there's something sad about that. And it's sad that, you know, like, if you're about to have the chance of dying and meet God, I thought the confession would be something like, you know, I wish I would have been more loving towards my wife. I wish I would, could have been, when I had the chance, be patient with my, my children. I wish I would have spent more time with my grandchildren. You know, something profound, but nothing really profound. And then I realized what bugged me about that was not about the guy, but about religion. Like, why didn't religion teach him to have, you know, kind of more depth of heart, that if you're going to, just before you meet God, you think you're going to really have more depth of longing and aching and even regret. Does, does that make sense? Not well. Didn't break any of the Ten Commandments lately. Uh, it should be something much greater. You know, in heaven, heaven is not really a matter of, you know, getting a checklist off. It really should be this way of life where you have this rich love and a deep heart. Uh, not just, well, I guess I haven't broken any of the ten big ones. And I, I just thought it was sad, but it also said something really kind of small about the church in that area. And I mentioned that because um, today we go over the Beatitudes, but you have to get the background, what's going on. Um, <clears throat> Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, is very, very Jewish. And this is the start of the Gospel of Matthew, and Jesus is the new Moses. He's always pictured in Matthew as the new Moses. And so whatever Moses does, the Messiah is going to do even greater. And so Moses goes up on the mountain and gives the Ten Commandments. So Jesus goes up on the mountain, and people gather all around, and he gives his new commandments, except they're really not commandments in the sense of prohibitive laws. Uh, they're not, you know, the Ten Commandments are, you just know if you broke them. But the Beatitudes are much different. You can go as far as you want with them. You know, they're, they're a w religious way of life. And so Jesus gives the Ten Commandments, but, or sorry, Jesus gives, that was a big mistake, Jesus gives the Beatitudes. But, you know, like, poor in spirit, and mercy, and hungering and thirsting for justice. You can go really deep with that stuff. That's a whole way of life. Um, and so this is Jesus' gospel in short. In fact, um, uh, Jesus, think about this. People would have walked for miles to get here. It's crowded, and you can read the eight Beatitudes in less than one minute. And it, what it really is, is it's a cliff notes of everything that's going to happen in the gospel. This is Jesus' entire teaching of the gospel of Matthew, giving you the cliff notes. But the same way he's the new Moses, in case you missed it, Moses was also a revolutionary. And Jesus wants to start this new revolution, not based on, you know, rules of where you mess up, but a revolution where you can go really deep in your heart. So the Galilee, and that's where he is right now, the Galilee is where revolutions would always start. So he goes to the, up on the mountain like Moses, and he wants religion to be this revolution. 
Well, we can go really deep. Um, and with the Beatitudes, they aren't just like a checklist where you didn't do things. The Beatitudes, when you practice them, um, they become part of who you are. You, you get to keep this. It's not just that you haven't done some mistake. It becomes part of who you are. Um, the Beatitudes, they really are the attitudes of those in heaven. It's a personality profile of those who are in the great feast of heaven. But obviously, it's really who Christ is. And you, when you die, you, if you take on the Beatitudes, you get this deep, rich life, and this is what you get to, uh, as your gift to God. And if you don't know what I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm being clear. Like um, Last Friday, we had the, a funeral for Connie Duplex, a very sweet woman, but you know, she was gifted with this really great memory, great brain, but all she really wanted to do in her life was be a mother and a wife. That was her greatest joy, was running around, cleaning and cooking and taking care of uh, her children. Uh, she loved pouring her life out for other people. You'd come over to her house and she would never sit down when a guest was there. She was always serving the guest. Um, you know, she, all she really wanted to do was pour out her life in serving and love. And she used to be heavily involved in Catholic Daughters when she was in California. I love this. And she, she was so heavily involved, she won, kept winning all these, like, uh, volunteer awards, which cracked me up, because they go to this conference, and somebody told me they went to this conference and said, now the award for, you know, blah, 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 Connie Duplex. And the award for blah, 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 Connie Duplex again. <laughs> and people got tired of clapping. <laughs> like, but, like, really, that's who she is. She poured out her life in service to other people. What I mean is that she gets to keep that. And heaven is a place where those who poured out their life in love and mercy and bravery, that's what they get to keep. Um, religion should be teaching you this, not just, okay, don't do these things and mess up. Religion should give you this great, rich life. And, like, I, I get on these little kicks, so I just finished three books on near-death experience, but one of my favorite near-death experience um, wasn't in those books, uh, <clears throat> was a story, and I love this, because it shocked me, uh, of this guy who used to be this kind of evangelical preacher, and he has this near-death experience. He dies. He goes through the tunnel. Uh, in front of the tunnel, he, there's this brilliant light. You guys know the story. He's never felt this much love before in his life. And the light can speak to him at super speed. And his whole life unfolds. And people say when your life unfolds, you just don't get to see your life. You get to feel your life. And... Um, he said in front of the light, he could feel, like when he was preaching, and he'd always have kind of these brim, fire and brimstone preaching, he could feel the terror of a little boy uh, being afraid, that he caused that. And in front of the light, the light said, you never really preached me, you preached politics. You know, when I die and go in front of the light, the light will say, you bored people. They slept so well. But my point being is that he comes back, and this is the amazing part, he comes back, and after this experience with the light, he starts to preach love. Not just love, that you've got to push yourself, um, to, you know, really push yourself in love. And guess what? Guess what happens? They fired him. <laughs> like, that's, but the point being is that in this oddity, his religion didn't prepare him for heaven. Take somebody for like Connie, like who poured out her life. When she dies and goes to heaven, she's going to fit in in heaven because she's already started to live it now. That's what the Beatitudes are. And so the Beatitudes, they're some, really, we can go deep with it. It's Christ's new laws. Not just, you know, don't do this, don't do that. We can go really deep in love and mercy. Um, and I just want to close with this. This... Um, kind of theologian, he rewrote the Beatitudes, um, or rephrased them. Um, and I just liked it, so I want to share this with you. Um, 
But how about this? Just if you want a little homework, because I'm serious about this. If you want to memorize the entire gospel in eight sentences, how about this? Your homework is this week. How about once a day, pray the Beatitudes. Pray that becomes who you are. Uh, more than just, you know, you haven't broken any of the Ten Commandments. Pray that you take on the personality of Christ. So I just want to read this because I like it. Blessed the church that is poor in spirit, who does not spend its life lusting after wealth. There God can truly reign. Bless the church who mourns with those who suffer and grieves with people who are hurting. One day she will be consoled. Bless the church who renounces imposing herself by force or co coercion, always practicing her Lord's gentleness. One day she will inherit the land. Blessed the church who has a hunger and thirst for justice, since she will work for the dignity of others. Her longing will be satisfied. Blessed the compassionate church that renounces rigorism and prefers mercy. She will receive mercy. Bless the church of the pure heart who doesn't cover up her sins or promote secrecy. One day she will see God. Bless the church who works for peace and struggles against making divisions. She will be the child of God. Bless the church who suffer, suffers hostility and persecution on account of love without fleeing martyrdom. She knows Jesus' cross. There God can truly reign.